Hey everyone, welcome to the show. I'm here today with Claudia Guerrero. Claudia, I hope I pronounced your last name properly. You did, yes, thank you. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for being here. Good morning and how are you? Good morning, I'm very well. How are you? I'm excellent, thank you. Um, so a little introduction to Claudia. Uh, you've had something like 15 to 20 years in the data field um, where you quickly moved up to management roles and you've had some really fantastic roles at the top of that ladder um, at many really uh, interesting companies. Um, you're now the head of data management at uh, Encompass Corporation. And uh, today we're going to be talking about your career, data science and engineering and what it takes it's to succeed in the field, I guess. I want to understand how you got into data. I know you've told me a little bit about this and it's an interesting story, but uh, tell it again, please, in your own words. As I reflect back, uh, I think it already started when I was very, 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 very young. Uh, not, I, I don't think many people know this at all, but uh, I think I was about eight years old when I started showing some uh, interest in um, maybe not data, but organizing things. Uh, in my spare time, I would basically go to a local library or even at school uh, to the school library and I would ask the librarians if they would allow me to go um, uh, inside and basically organize the books for them. No way. <laughs> so I actually did that very often and I just loved being there. I loved browsing books. Uh, I, I, I identified many books that I would read myself. Uh, and, uh, you know, funny enough, fast forward this to when I was 20, 21, I arrived in the UK. Uh, my English was good enough to communicate. Uh, but I, I, I really wanted to improve it. I wanted to speak well. And someone suggested I should get a uh, job in a call center because that would obviously help me. And so I did. Uh, uh, at the time, um, I referred to Metro uh, for, <laughs> for such information. There was this uh, newspaper. I'm not sure if it's still out. Um, and there was this very simple advert for telephone researcher. Uh, it didn't talk about many requirements, um, sort of fit uh, what I was looking for. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I've sent my very basic CV. That was the first time I ever wrote a CV. Uh, I look at it now. I, I want to laugh. That's how <laughs> bad it is <laughs> because I, uh, I, I really didn't say much. Uh, but the business at the time... Um, really needed people who were keen to do the job and uh, me and four other people who attended the interview at the time, we were all offered the job and that's where it all started, uh, telephone researcher. A crazy transformation though, because from that telephone researcher, you kind of create a data job for yourself, right? <laughs> that is true. I mean, the funny thing is, um, I left Poland when I was... Um, after the third year of my uh, bachelor degree in, in mathematics, and I I was doing this telephone researching job, and I was utterly bored. Um, so I would look, I would optimize everything I needed to do, and uh, my colleagues constantly ran out of work for me to do. So they wanted to send me home, but because I was paid hourly, I'm like, well, I'm not going anywhere. Give me something else to do. Mm. <laughs> And, uh, you know, they just didn't have anything else because, you know, uh, we weren't uh, planning that much ahead. So I started looking for work myself. <laughs> I would look at um, the things that I was doing. I worked in Excel, so that's where we needed to enter the data we found. I would start optimizing the manner of entering that data there to make sure that at the end of it all, it was just perfectly <laughs> clean and complete and all. And I would help my colleagues with the same. Uh, I would start building reports in Excel, uh, which would answer some of my own and my co other colleagues' questions. And, and that really never stopped. <laughs> the things you're describing, this is like the beginning of the journey you've carried on, you know, trying to sanitize and make data fit for purpose and then deciding on what that purpose is and making sure it has the right outcomes. That is true. That is so true. And, you know, I reflect back. Um, and at the time I was, I was just uh, 
doing what I believed needed to be done to make things more efficient, make things more optimized. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it much. Now I consciously plan for optimizing. Now I consciously plan for making things efficient. At the time, it was just, it just made sense. It was logical mm -hmm. uh, to operate that way. In what sense do you think you were kind of just built for this role? I think this goes back to what I shared about going to the local library. Um, I just have this natural aptitude for wanting to organize things. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, you know where to find whatever it is that you are looking for when you are after it. And it was just there way before I had any idea about full-time work. I mean, eight years old. Little did I know, reading, reading fairy tales, you know, I mean, mm. <laughs> living in my bubble. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, it's just, it, it's just deeply there inside wanting to organize things, uh, wanting to make information uh, available when it is needed. So take me through in a little bit more detail, please, that that period where you've invented this data role for yourself, how does that come about? And then how do you sell that to your bosses? Yeah, this is this. Yeah. And uh, another interesting story there. Um, so having done a bit of this optimizing in Excel, um, I, I was talking to a few people, my colleagues in IT, our director of technology at the time, and they talked to me about databases and I was like, um, you know, this SQL thing, can you explain it to me? How do I do it? And I remember uh, Rick Hartley, who was our director of technology at the time, he gave me this one SQL query with a single join and he explained the logic of it to me. And basically that, that was it. That like changed my world <laughs> uh, because uh, he gave me access to, to the database he gave me access to the data and just allowed me to play. And I basically, I was very curious. So I kept playing with that query. I started changing it. I, I started looking at uh, how data was organized in that database. Uh, and as I was on it, I, I, I mean, the level of curiosity I, I was in at the time was just through the roof because everything I touched, I just wanted to understand. So... I um, very quickly started helping out with <clears throat> with administering our database. Someone there was a lot of failing processes, and they needed someone who would just be there looking at it, picking up when something failed to restart the system. And I was like, "Yeah, I'll, I'll do this." Like I always volunteered <laughs> to do things, um, and very quickly um, they I think they sort of realized that. I was, I was doing quite a good job with organizing things. And so um, my manager at the time, uh, Nicola Wartnaby, yeah, she asked me if I would be up for uh, looking after the entire team of telephone researchers. Uh, so there were about five of us. Uh, you know, I was like, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I obviously agreed. Um, and from that day onwards, to be honest, I realized that, you know, these things, this is possible, you know, I'm not just this nobody who is sitting here doing telephone research. There are opportunities out there and I could be, they could be for me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was so, it's so ironic in a way, because here I was with this degree in applied mathematics uh, feeling so insecure and lacking confidence so much that I didn't see um, a world bigger than that job I was doing at the time. I didn't feel like I deserved to be part of that bigger world, um, that I had access to it. So that was, that was a life-changing moment. It was very encouraging. I obviously worked very hard. Um, and as I interacted with more people, people more uh, context, I realized, you know, this was another funny milestone realization. 
uh, I realized mm, some years after that first offer, what does it take? I was thinking to myself, what does it mean to be a director? Well, directing things, right? So I'm, I'm, I can't wait for someone to tell me what to do. I need to be coming up with things by myself and I need to be driving these things. And that's exactly what I started doing. I was no longer um, asking for someone to give me a direction. I decided that something needed to be done and I would do it. For example, I wanted to uh, find a vendor to help us solve certain challenges we had with our system. Um, I think this was related to data duplication at the time. And I started meeting organizations who were able to help us. And I would talk to them. I would try to understand what it is that they offer. And I would attempt to build uh, a business case for how they may be the right fit for us. Um, so, yeah. Um, basically, after that first offer... I draw things myself, so I would be asking of how we can, you know, uh, expand my responsibilities um, and uh, give me more flexibility to do what I believe needed to be done. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think uh, Terrapin at the time, uh, they promoted me four times. Mm -hmm. The job titles, you know, they aren't that informative today. To be honest, what I was doing there for most of my time was data architecture and data engineering. I had those different job titles, manager, director, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, uh, they, they called me the data queen. Mm -hmm. So I would do everything and anything that needed to be done with our data and our data systems. In hindsight, you're really lucky to have worked at that place where they were, where they were open to things like that and were nurturing you and enabling you to do those things. Thank you. You know, that's, that's, so, that's so true. Um, I worked incredibly hard. I mean, don't get, don't get me wrong. I notoriously did, uh, nights and weekends. I just absolutely loved what I was doing. Uh, but I understood that only after I left Serapin that my boss, Sharon Rosen, she was our chief marketing officer and I reported directly to her. She, I understood that she just knew how to manage me. She just understood uh, how to work with, with me, which basically meant she, her giving me space <laughs> to do mm -hmm. uh, what I, I wanted to do. Uh, and it was incredibly liberating because instead of having to get her buy-in, get her trust in me, so she would allow me to spend time on doing things, 100% of my time went into problem solving mm, great. and working with her and my colleagues on making sure that what I was delivering was actually truly solving their problems and they understood what they were given at the end of my projects. It's fantastic. Well, I mean, they must have, uh, you know, very clearly seen, you know, um, what you had to offer, you know, and they, they could trust you to deliver and make the right decisions. I guess, I guess. Uh, we had this joke at the time. My colleagues in IT used to complain how they are always pushed for deadlines and how they are chased for delivering work on time. <laughs> and we laughed because I said to them, well, Sharon never uh, asks me for deadlines. She just accepts the deadlines I provide. <laughs> uh, but only years later, she said, I had, I had my way for... Um, identifying deadlines that were fit for purpose. They were always based on me having built a prototype first. Uh, even an MVP, I would always build the first skeleton of my product. And uh, yeah, it, it was always me providing the deadlines, not the other way around. And I, she just trusted me. Mm. I think trust, the fact that I had a boss who actually trusted me, uh, that was the most liberating thing. If you're enjoying this podcast, make sure to check out Electronic Specifier Insights. Their editors dig into the electronics industry, how new tech is shaping our post-COVID world, reviews from all the top electronics shows, and the latest tech electronic companies are releasing. You can find them by searching for Electronic Specifier Insights on any streaming service or by going to electronicspecifier.com slash news slash podcast. Even though I'm in engineering myself, I and you know, I mean, I've worked with databases, but I feel like 
I uh, I don't know what, even one percent of one percent of what you know uh, my peer in data would know. You know, I don't understand this data space. I'm vaguely aware of like you know some of the boundaries between like engineering, science, and governance. Can you just briefly sort of fill me in? Um, what what are the key roles in the space now, and what the boundaries are between those? Wow, this is a great question. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, data making data work uh, is takes a lot. Mm. It doesn't take one person uh, to make that happen. Um, it takes a whole team of people to make data work with different skills. Um, data engineering, uh, data analysis, uh, database administration, uh, making sure the infrastructure works, communicating with people, architecting the solutions, designing the solution that you are building so the users actually enjoy their experience. Um, so in many ways, I guess the roles in data are very similar to software engineering, um, software development, a much more mature discipline. Mm. Um, I guess the nuance is that um, with data, you actually need to be quite specific. Uh, the closer to detail you get with data engineering, the more precise you need to be uh, in terms of um, how you write the code, what your code is supposed to be doing. Uh, and what is all that for? Well, data today uh, is held in many different places, in many different forms and shapes. It's created by different sources, by people, by machine. All of that comes with a variety, with high speed of change, um, with high volumes. And you need to have a team of people who can make sense out of all of it, capture those patterns that are visible uh, or maybe not so visible and accommodate for them so that at the end of the day, uh, whatever your intention is in terms of what you are hoping to deliver, be it a report, be it a um, an application, mobile phone application, it just needs to work. Yeah, the boundaries, they are not very clear at all. Uh, mm -hmm. to be quite honest with you. Um, they, they are not black and white roles. There is a lot of overlap. Mm. Yeah, I guess the, the, where the roles differ is the level of detail you look at and the um, scope you are considering in your thinking. Um, you can be very uh, specific and just think about one particular component um being mindful of its inputs and its outputs uh, but you can also be very holistic very strategic and seeing things at a wider uh, spectrum but not going into so much detail so i guess uh the scope and the level of detail mm. is where the roles will differ but there is a, a lot of overlap um i guess you you nailed it right there that it's just not a very mature discipline yet, is it? And, you know, many people, many large, huge organizations don't give it the respect it deserves. Traditionally, data teams will be the smallest team, kind of sat in a corner. They might hire a few people. And I don't think they really understand what, what more they could be doing, right? And of course, instead of hiring a team, they could just hire you. Yeah, yeah um, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of funny. You know, we all have probably heard this line which says that data scientists spend, you know, 60 to 80% of the time on finding um, the data they need and preparing that data for analytics. And maybe that is, uh, a, um, that is a statement to how immature uh, data management is as a discipline. Why can't the data be organized and available for advanced analytics? Uh, why do we have data scientists instead of building uh, algorithms fit for purpose and deriving insight? Why do we have them uh, do data cleansing? Mm. Maybe that is a symptom of uh, where things are.
yeah. with data management as a discipline. Data management being a rather all-encompassing term. Mm. Data management being an area that uh, covers many disciplines of data, like data engineering, like data architecture, security, quality, yeah. etc. Machine learning and AI, for example, you know, are often thought of as you know, a, 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 as data as, as being the the genesis uh, of the need of those technologies. And I mean, I guess there's a huge crossover, right? You must use uh, ML and AI quite a lot, or the teams that you manage. Data doesn't magically become ready for machine learning algorithms. There's a lot of work that needs to go into it. This is your sixty to eighty percent of the data scientist's time. Now, that's one data scientist. Imagine an entire team. Imagine an entire organization. If the organization hasn't planned for being ready for advanced analytics, for machine learning, um, and other um, other analytical methods like that, uh, it takes effort to be ready, to make oneself ready. Mm-hmm. Um, and the organizations I have joined... You know, I come in as someone who tries to bring some voice of sanity to data, make people realize that there is a lot more that needs to be considered if you want to make data work for yourself and your organization and your customers. Mm-hmm. So I guess uh, the organizations I join, they are they want to do advanced analytics, they want to introduce machine learnings, but there is a journey to be had. Because you know you you are the kind of person that companies bring on to sort of sort out all their data uh, problems or you know take things to the next level or actually get the outcomes that they want. Typically, what sort of issues do you face when you go into a role like this? Well, this is a great question. Um, you know, I I actually share this with colleagues often. A lot of my time these days is spent on educating my colleagues on what is possible. Uh, just opening their eyes uh, to how much more could be done, but also making them realize how much they don't know. Mm. And education. A lot of my time is spent on education. And, you know, in all honesty, I need to educate myself too, often, all the time. The more I know, the more I realize how much I don't know. Mm. <laughs> so education all the time. Uh, but together with that, um, just communicating with colleagues at a high level how we could be solving the challenges that we have and how sometimes um, doing something with data itself isn't where it needs to start. Um, the beginning of the journey is where we identify what problems we are trying to solve. And often, one of the first things I do is actually identifying what problems are there. Because I have often found myself in situations where people just didn't even realize they had a problem. Mm. They were experiencing an organization or the customers were experiencing some sort of pain, <laughs> Uh, some sort of discomfort, but no one could quite put their finger on what was going on. I see. So that's where a lot of my time goes. Uh, a lot of analysis of the problem itself. What is actually going on? What is it that we do? Where are the challenges and what can we improve? Um, and then obviously working with teams um, relevant teams so we could do something about it. What are, uh, in your opinion, the signs that a business doesn't have data under control? Look at the job titles across the organization. Um, how many people uh, there have data in their job title? That's number one. Number two, does the organization have a data architect? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I guess the common scenario is, yeah, something happens with data in one shape or another. There is an application, there is software that is supposed to be doing something. Where is, where is data architect? Software architect is not the same person as data architect. Where is a data architect? 
uh, who tries to make sense of how uh, the other components across the technical estate fit with data. So to me, that often is a sign of how of where a company is in terms of data management maturity. Mm. Are there enough data architects to deal with the uh, amount of projects that are happening with the amount of products the company manages? Um, what's the general understanding across the organization on of certain concepts like what is metadata? How do you manage it well? Why should you even care? Mm. Uh, what is data quality? It sounds simple on the surface, but how do you look at the data you have as an organization and how do you define what good data looks like? Mm. You, have you had that conversation? Have you formalized the definition of good quality data that is fit for your context? Uh, basics, I mean, forget advanced data infrastructure, forget AWS and clouds and other um, means to deal with your data physically, sort of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what is the general understanding across the organization of what it means to make data work? You're a data doctor, kind of. <laughs> I don't think you could say that. <laughs> uh, I'm like this Sherlock Holmes of data. I investigate things. I try to make sense out of things to really be able to put my finger and clearly logically see how things work, how things happen, why something works, why something doesn't work. Um, and whilst I don't apply mathematical formulas to what I do, I apply the mindset that studying mathematics uh, equipped me with. Mm. The problem solving mindset of a mathematician. Did you ever study uh, coding? I think we did a little bit of VBA when I was doing my first degree. Um, we did a bit of R when I was doing my master's um, and that was in uh, statistics. Um, but it was very minimal. Um, I'm always intrigued, though. It's uh, it's one of those things I wish I had done. Uh, software engineering. Well, I mean, don't put yourself down, because, I mean, um, your job titles won't uh, give this away, but you're actually very technical, right? You've, you've come up with a lot of the data solutions that you actually ended up implementing at these companies, right? That is true. That is true. And... Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, don't pay too much attention to any job titles. Uh, I think they can sometimes be um, not representative of what the reality is actually at all. That is very true. I have I have built, um, I have architected, I have engineered, I have built many data solutions. Very very technical. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just because I haven't written uh, any Java code is, has nothing to do with it. Uh, many of, well, I would say the first 10 years of my career were very, very technical. So making systems work, uh, writing code uh, for making data work, SQL, I did a lot of VBA, just automating things. So they would just run on their own and I would only be alerted if there truly was an unexpected problem that I didn't see coming. Mm. I want to move on to Compare the Market, uh, where you were a senior data manager and then you moved into senior uh, manager of uh, data governance. Uh, and uh, that's where we met. We spent some time together there. We we never worked directly together. You were in data, I was in engineering. Um, talk me through uh, that change, because you've gone from Terrapin at the time, where it's presumably a much smaller company. CTM is fairly large, uh, and it's pretty, it has, you know, really great uh, engineering culture, and it's pretty advanced in terms of engineering, and I would say data, relatively speaking. So what what takes you away from Terrapin and then into CTM. What's what's your motivation there? Um, 
yeah, another another one of those interesting stories. Um, when I left Terrapin, that was I think I was there for eleven years or something like that. Mm-hmm. I had worked very hard. I, to be honest, I started working when I was fourteen years old. I I did my school, and then after school, I gave private maths lessons uh, six days a week. And I also I was a a distributor of Avon Cosmetics. So I I started making my own money at the age of fourteen. Um, when I came to the UK, I worked during the day and I studied in the evenings. Uh, first, it was the language school and then I did my master's degree. Well, actually, language school, then I completed my bachelor's degree in Poland because I had half a year left and the final exam to do it. And then I did a master's in the UK. So by the time I I was getting close to leaving Terrapin, it was the first time in my life where there was just work and I could come home and not worry about doing anything else. And um, unfortunately, I also realized that uh, I was completely burnt out. Um, I was as flat as it got. Um, I um, luckily um, I I was no longer with Terrapin. Uh, having spent a few months in bed, I mean literally in bed. I I was in such a bad state. I I couldn't go to the shop and bring myself milk and bread. Um, I was slowly getting better and a friend was, um, one of those serendipitous events, a friend was going to Ghana to record a movie and he got some funding for and asked if I wanted to join. So I, I thought that was going to do me good. So I did. And when I was in Ghana, maybe two months in, I thought, you know, I'm feeling much better. So it's time to, uh, think about going back to the UK and look for a job. Uh, And because I was already away, I felt comfortable leaving London. I thought, I don't need to be there. Let me see what's going on in the rest of the country. And the advert for a data manager at Compare the Market just came up on LinkedIn. I sent my CV and uh, Jeremy, uh, uh, who was the hiring manager, Jeremy Snyman, called me we had a good chat and yeah i never looked back Uh, i came back to the uk had an interview face to face and they offered me the role and i accepted of course Um, so that was the motivation um the reality it all was great when i joined the business i realized what a shock to my system that was because not only i was still burnt out completely um just the whole change of scene, moving from London to Peterborough, uh, working in this massive organization where now it's no longer me figuring things out from 10 different people's perspective. So I could just make sense out of everything and just build the solutions. Now I was operating in an entire department where different people were doing the different things. Um, dealing with agile, not agile as a way of building solutions that just work very well, because that's how I've always done, but agile as a way to organize people, to organize work. Um, that was such a shock to my system. To be quite honest with you, I had no idea what was going on. Seriously. <laughs> I was sleeping 14 hours every day. I was exhausted every single day. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how I sort of survived it. It was incredibly hard. Um, yeah, but, you know, I I, I tried and I, I guess it sort of worked. <laughs> uh, because a few months into my role as a data manager, um, they really needed someone to look at data security. And I guess by then I have as I had established enough credibility, so they trusted me. Uh, with looking after that uh, area, um, which was a big deal for compared to market data security. Mm -hmm. And so I agreed because in all honesty at the time, and I was very open about it, I knew nothing about security, but it's something I had wanted to uh, understand. And I thought it was a great opportunity to uh, put my hands on it and just actually really work with security and understand what it's all about. So I agreed to take the role on and yeah, 
and um, another fascinating ride <laughs> began. <Yeah. laughs> the, re the rest is history. And we're going to move on to that. But I want to ask about being burnt out because I kind of had a similar experience myself about a year ago when I left my last job. I mean, I, I assume you don't really see it coming until it's taken hold of you. You don't, I guess when you, when I started noticing it, when I realized something was going wrong, it was too late already. Mm. Um, and I had a bike accident in which I nearly died. Uh, I was, I was so incredibly lucky uh, that I knew it at the time. I was, um, we did a trip from London to Brighton a one day bike ride. And I knew going, sitting on my bike that morning that I was just no longer having the strength in me that I was used to. I understood that day something was different and I was very weak, like physically weak. And that, that um, bike accident made me realize something was very wrong. Um, but it was already too late, yeah. Um, it took, that was in summer, and I only left therapy in, I think, January, the year after that. So I, I literally stayed with it for that long. When I left therapy, I completely collapsed, uh, like, completely. Um, uh, it was way too late already. Uh, mm. So, yeah. Wow, you really sold your done for a long time. I would have quit way before then. At the time, I, I didn't really understand what burnt out was. I mean, something like that. I had no such concept in my head. Mm. <laughs> um, it's only much later, even at the time when I was in my bed, uh, incapable of moving at all. Even then, I still didn't fully comprehend what was happening. It was only months and months and months later when I um, looked back and started connecting the dots, uh, I started understanding what was actually going on. I had no help whatsoever at the time, uh, which didn't make it any easier. Uh, mm. And then you, you go to Ghana, but then you say, actually, that trip didn't uh, uh, completely refill your batteries no, and you were still burnt out when you came back. Absolutely. Uh, I think being in Ghana, it was a survival mode again. So I had to lift myself up mm -hmm. um, and get on with it. And I wanted to utilize the opportunity for um, being there and getting to know the people and the culture. Um, but it was a complete change of environment. Uh, so I think that, that was a shock, another shock to my system. Uh, and having to be in that survival mode again. Um, but to be honest with you, um, it, it isn't just a year. It's a, uh, I, I don't think I will ever be as I used to be. Uh, that drive that was in me before burnt out, burnout uh, is gone. And it may be a good thing, you know, because I, would have, I was a bit obsessive about things. <laughs> I had so much passion and so much drive for just getting things done, understanding what I wanted to understand. And it was criticized uh, left and right, always, always, always. Um, and I guess it's now so somewhat written in my head that uh, being obsessive like that is just not good for you and you shouldn't be like it. Mm. <laughs> so some part of me almost feels like it's actually good. It's better for my well-being, but another part of me really misses this relentless uh, curiosity and relentless drive and commitment to understand things so that I can make other things work. I miss it. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. You know, if I look back, would I do anything differently? Um, yeah, I think I would do one thing differently. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so obsessed with work. Um, mm -hmm. I was so dedicated to the solutions I was building. 
uh, no hour of the day was too late or too early. Um, but it just wasn't sustainable. And I, I, I remember Zan, thank you, you, you taught me that. Uh, Zan Buchanan from Compare the Market. Um, sustainable pace. Mm. Sustainable pace so I can keep going for longer at a healthy level to me and to my surroundings. And so then did you eventually find a way to cure your burnout or, or what sort of fixed it? Time, um, you know, six years. It's now, it's now been six or seven years. Yeah, uh, and I'm sort of good. Um, but I never took any medicine. Uh, I didn't see any therapists about it. Um, I would just try to take one day at a time. Mm. There was a lot of anxiety, of course, because from operating at this level of um, mm, productivity, I now had to get used to <laughs> operating at this level. Mm. And uh, it's my own anxiety that makes me uncomfortable operating at this level, even though I know I used to be here. Mm. Uh, but this is this is normal. This is humane. <laughs> this is the humane level. So I remind myself that actually the way I operate is more normal. <laughs> so it's okay. Yep. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Uh, no one should be killing themselves for their job. Um, if you want to keep on working and learning, uh, do something else, you know, learn something for yourself or work on a side project or something fun, right? Over the years, I've recognized the value in um, gaining perspective. Mm. If you constantly work, no matter how much you love what you do, because I did what I did do because I loved it. I was chasing the solution. I was testing a hundred options until I found the one that was exactly the one I was happy with. I loved it. Um, but you need to gain perspective. And a good way of doing that is to do something different, be somewhere different, uh, be in different surroundings, totally change your context. Um, it's so, so important. It will help you see things clearer. It will help you think of solutions you didn't see otherwise. Mm -hmm. Walk me up to the current point. What draws you into your current role? And wh what's it like there? What are you up to? At Encompass, uh, you know, same story. I, uh, I, 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 I try to uh, talk about uh, what's possible with data and how we can do things better to better meet our own ambitions, to, to satisfy our customers, uh, more uh, to be more effective internally, operationally. Um, the difference here is uh, that um, we are building something that demands that the data is processed very fast. And this is a little bit different to how I've worked uh, in previous organizations. Um, so I think I'm closer at Encompass to the dream that I have about data than I was before. Uh, this dream that I have is that just like we talk about uh, microservices that help an application world, application development world, I want a, a setup where we have data functions. Why do I need to have 20 different locations where I cleanse address data? Why don't I have just one function I can call for whenever needed? And it's constructed elegantly, cleverly, so the logic there can deal with whatever uh, structure it needs to tap into. That's the world I want to see. Uh, data functions, so that we stop rewriting the same things, the same concepts over and over again. So we can do it once, do it well, elegantly and cleverly, and move on to doing other things and solving different problems. And I feel like um, the reason I was so 
uh, interested uh, when the opportunity to join in Compass uh, came um, was again getting closer to that world, getting closer to that world where data flows in real time from the source to the customer, and it's just fit for purpose when it reaches the customer. In a sense, uh, necessity is the mother of uh, of invention. So you have this need to do amazing, powerful things with data, and you obviously you have to come up with the solutions for that, right? Yeah, they sound, the, the interesting part is these things sound amazing um, if you take into consideration the level of maturity the organizations are at when it comes to data. I achieved that kind of level of automation when I worked at Terrapin. I was one person. I had all the knowledge about our technical estate and our data, about my users, about our organization's customers, the data that was coming in, the data that needed to come out. And I was able to architect solutions that followed these principles. And it was nothing amazing. It just, not in my uh, head, it just made sense to optimize to that level. So it was logic that was kicking in as opposed to manually written, hard-coded rules. Um, I think it just takes that in the organizations that I work for, uh, including in Compass, is that recognition that you can actually cleverly build things and aim for that automation. My line here is maximize automation, minimize manual handling. Mm. Um, so that's how I try to drive solutions. Aim for maximizing automation, minimizing manual handling. It truly is possible and it is less difficult than it seems. That's fantastic. I mean, it's a promised land for you, right? I'm very, very happy for you, Claudia. Um, Maybe one day you'll hire me as a junior data scientist or something, and we, get to, <laughs> we can work together again. That would be awesome. <laughs> I'd love to have you as a boss. That would be fun. <laughs> so look, uh, I, I know our time is running out. I have a final uh, double-headed question for you to, to end on. Uh, broadly speaking, where is the industry heading now? I mean, what are the exciting frontiers now, and what's next for you? I think where things are heading, and it's from my point of view, I haven't been as close to the industry updates uh, in the last uh, year or so. But I think generally where things are heading is that realization uh, that automation, machine learning, uh, deriving constructive insights from data is possible. Uh, but there is a price to be paid to have it. Those things, this uh, automated extraction of insight, is a cherry on the top of your cake. And the cake is making your data work for your organization, making data and your infrastructure, your architecture, your system fit for those advanced algorithms that are capable of extracting constructive insight. And... Um, it's no magic. Uh, it's just hard work. And if you, if you understand what's going on, if you understand what it takes to make data work, you can have it too. Great. And what's next for you? I guess time will tell, but you know, I never stop learning. Uh, this voice in my head always wants to learn, always tells me it's the next bit to understand. We'll see. Um, we'll see. Uh, for now, uh, I have an amazing team at Incompass, uh, wonderful, wonderful people. Um, and we are working together, together to evolve what we do with data. And it's exciting. Fantastic. Very, very happy for you. Um, and before I let you go, I need the joke of the show. A husband said, uh, speaks uh, <clears throat> to, to, to his friends. He says, uh, my wife asked me to uh, get her a lipstick. Um, I, I confused the lipstick for a glue. And I think she's still angry with me because she still doesn't talk to me. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. I don't so, uh, <laughs> okay. none of such uh, tricks on me. Thank you. <laughs> no, no one would dare. Thank you again so much for your time. This has been amazing. It's been great catching up. 
thank you so much, Sanjay. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, and yeah, good luck. I, I am very excited to see um, who else you bring on the show. Um, I, I love your shows, so thank, thank you for you. making me. And that's all, folks. Thanks a lot for tuning in. For more info, for questions, comments, or feedback, please head on over to aheadintech.com and don't forget to subscribe.